Um, I think we're probably in pretty good shape right now. And I'd like to begin our lecture if we possibly could. Uh, again, just to repeat in case it didn't come through before, uh, we're going to discuss today, and this is History of Miami's offerings for the next couple of weeks, uh, major topics uh, in Miami and South Florida history. And it's been a, uh, a wonderfully eventful history, and I think even monumental uh, in terms of how things have developed in this community. And so I want to talk today about Tuttle, Mary Brickle, Henry Flagler, uh, and the birth of modern Miami. Uh, so I put together this morning a, an outline that's way too thick and dense for the amount of time we have, but it's really kind of hard to, um, to cover this topic uh, in a sparse way because there's so much material and so many interesting elements to the beginnings of Miami. Suffice it to say that Miami has been around for a long time. Uh, we've had humans living in the greater Miami area more than 10,000 years ago. But in terms of Miami as a community, it was only birthed in 1896. In fact, as late as 1895, according to the Florida State Census, just nine people, if you can imagine this, were living on both banks of the Miami River at its mouth. So it's come a long way since then. The city today has about 465,000 people. The county has more than 2.7 million people. So we've grown incredibly fast. Um, one of the reasons for the birth, of course, was the entry of Henry M. Flagler's Florida East Coast Railway into Miami, reaching the north bank of the river in April of 1896. Until that time, Flagler, who had purchased a small railroad line in the late 1880s and had extended it from, uh, it ran initially from Jacksonville to St. Augustine, extended all the way down the east coast of Florida. His train had stopped in 1894 in West Palm Beach. And there he built, and already had built by the time the train arrived, the magnificent Royal Poinciana Hotel, a huge wood frame building, built at one point as the largest wood frame building in the world, with about 1,150 guest rooms, if you can imagine that. And uh, he was there for a while. But Julia Tuttle, who had purchased land in, uh, that we cover much of today's downtown Miami in the late 1880s, and had moved down here in November of 1891, was very antsy to develop Miami. She saw it as having so many attributes, you know, location and waters and clouds and the skies. And she was just a huge champion of it. Julia had discovered Miami in 1875 when she came down for the first time to visit her parents who were beyond middle age and were homesteading in today's Miami Shores area. And she immediately fell in love with the area, especially the area on the north bank of the river at the mouth which had hosted over time a slave plantation complex, had hosted an army fort, Fort Dallas, which was an alternative name for Miami as late as 1896. And so uh, I think in her heart of hearts, she vowed to come back here on a regular basis or permanent basis one day. And, and indeed she did when she moved down as a widow with her two children um, in 1891, November 13th. Um, so, she wanted to see something go on here. She understood that before Miami could really develop and really begin to take advantage of its great assets, natural and otherwise, we would need a connection with the outside world other than sailboat. And um, she contacted Henry Flagler. Uh, even before that, she had contacted the Henry Plan Organization, which was developing portions of the west coast of Florida. He was a large tycoon out of Connecticut. And in fact, she was able to talk a friend of hers, James Engram, who she had met in Cleveland before she left Cleveland to move to Miami, to uh, mount an expedition. This was absolutely insane in retrospect, across the Everglades to assess the feasibility of building a rail line through the swamp, which at that point technologically was absolutely impossible. They got lost and they were harried and they were rescued. And uh, it became pretty obvious you, you weren't going to extend the um, the railway of Mr. Plant uh, across the Everglades to Miami. Meantime, uh, James Engram, who had been one of the chief lieutenants of Henry Plant, uh, took a position with Henry Flagler's railroad organization, again, developing the east coast of Florida. And uh, so Tuttle felt like she really had a trump card in that she knew, she knew Engram, and Engram was aware of her plans. And so, um, very long story short, she had Ingram uh, in her pocket then as kind of an ace holding on to that till the time she really needed to use them. And meantime, Mother Nature had interceded in the form of two severe freezes, December 29, 1894 and February 7th of 1895 that destroyed farms and citrus crops as far south as well into today's Palm Beach County. And um, if, um, if Miami was spared the frost, which it was, the freeze, 
uh, this would be the ideal argument then for uh, encouraging Flagler to move his railroad farther south to the Miami River, and that's indeed what happened. She was able to get the ear of Ingram. Uh, Ingram visited her. We're talking now in February of 1895. He went back with some undamaged orange blossoms, and I want to read to you uh, his account of that meeting in February of 1895 on the heels of the second freeze and how it had spared Miami. He said, and I quote, this is out of a marvelous article authored by Larry Wiggins uh, entitled The Birth of Miami, which appeared in Tequesta, History of Miami's journal, uh, for the 1995 edition. He said, and I quote, and this was before the Miami Women's Club in 1920 when they were dedicating a plaque in honor of Henry Flagler, who had passed away just seven years earlier. I quote, I found at Lauderdale, at Lemon City, Buena Vista, Miami, Coconut Grove, and at Cutler orange trees, lemon trees, and lime trees blooming or about to bloom without a leaf hurt. Vegetables growing in a small way untouched. There had been no frost there. I gathered up a lot of blooms from these various trees, put them in damp cotton, and after an interview with Mrs. Tuttle and Mr. and Mrs. Brickle of Miami, I hurried to St. Augustine where I called on Mr. Flagler and showed him the orange blossoms telling him that I believe that these orange blossoms were from the only part of Florida, except possibly a small area in the extreme southerly part of the western coast, which had escaped the freeze. So here was the evidence that uh, Flagler would have that Miami, at least up to that point, was frostproof and might be a great place to extend his railroad, to build a resort, to develop a city. And so Flagler, upon receiving this and hearing the account by James Ingram, said, how fast can we get down there? And Ingram said, we'll make sure we get down there quickly. And by boat and by stage line, they ended up visiting Julia Tuttle in late February of 1895, uh, talked with her. Flagler verbally agreed in consideration for a lot of land that she would give them out of her allotment of land. She had about 640 acres in downtown Miami, and the Brickles had thousands of acres on the south bank of the river, and they too agreed to throw in a lot of land in order to entice Flagler to bring his railroad uh, to the Miami River. And so the verbal offer then uh, was laid out, and Flagler accepted that in February of 1895. Um, he agreed, Flagler agreed in exchange for this land, and they got more specific as time went on about what the land would entail. Uh, he agreed to not only move his railroad down, but to help lay out a city, as it turned out on the north bank of the river, and to build what today you might call a major tourist uh, hotel, which would be the Royal Palm Hotel in the DuPont Plaza neighborhood of today. And there was a formal contract, a contractual agreement was signed and sealed in October of 1895 that updated this verbal agreement in February of 1895. And I wanted to read to you one small clause in this contract. I have it here in a, a book. And this is uh, Clause 13. The party, the second part covenants, that's Henry Flagler, covenants to construct at Fort Dallas, they're still calling it Fort Dallas, they haven't formally named it Miami. That will come with the incorporation of the city of Miami. Formally uh, to construct at Fort Dallas, upon the location set apart for the same within the 100 acres aforesaid, this is very legalese as you can see, within 18 months after the completion of the railroad, a hotel, so he's gonna build a hotel within 18 months of the railroad's entry. And in erecting said hotel, said second party, that's Flagler, agrees the said hotel shall not be erected or any other structure, whatever, south of line drawn from the northerly line, very legalese, of the residence of the party, the first part, this Julia Tuttle, easterly to the shore of the bay so as to interrupt a free vision of the bay from the present located residence, a party of the first part. So what Flagler is agreeing to here is he will not build his Royal Palm Hotel at the confluence putting this book down now, at the confluence of the mouth of the river in Biscayne Bay because it would block Julia Tuttle's view of the bay from her front porch, which faced east. And so this is interesting because Flagler was worth scores of millions of dollars at that point, if not more, and Julia wasn't worth a lot of money, but she had the foresight and, let's use a, a Yiddish term, the moxie, uh, to approach Flagler with this request, and he accepted it. So we've got the agreement then. Meantime, even before the agreement was sealed, word had gotten out the railroad was going to move down to Miami. The Flagler people began to lay out the extension uh, by the late spring, early summer of 1895. They had 65 miles to go, and they began to, in a north-south direction, fell trees, 
braid the rail bed, lay the track, uh, and eventually, of course, run the train over the track. Uh, initially, Flagler was, was going to run that railroad uh, east of today's downtown Fort Lauderdale through a piece of property known as Coley Hammock. It's gorgeous in Fort Lauderdale on the north bank of the New River that the Brickles owned. Uh, but Mary Brickle essentially said, you can't do that. That's choice land. I don't want to see it developed in that fashion. So if you've looked at the trajectory of the railroad, and uh, I conduct a tour every December on Brightline uh, that takes our tour goers and myself, of course, from Miami to Fort Lauderdale. And we look at the, at the train station, Fort Lauderdale, out straight north and northeast. And you'll see how the train tracks have moved at one point from a straight south direction then radically straight west and then south again because they moved away from encroaching upon that Coley Hammock area that Mary Brickle said was a no-no for railroad development. Uh, soon settlers began to pour into the area. Many of these, in fact, were farmers and growers who had been wiped out by those great freezes of 1894-95 coming to Miami in particular, but also other parts of the area along the right of way of the railroad to get back on their feet again financially with new jobs, and in this case, primarily construction jobs. By the end of January of 1896, Miami's birth year, about 200 men were clearing the town site of Miami. On February 22, 1896, the Florida East Coast Railway entered what would be today the western edges of downtown Fort Lauderdale, but it dead-ended on the north bank of the New River because there wasn't any trestle to cross the river at that point. That wouldn't be completed until April of 1896 to allow the railroad then to move straight south from there. Uh, meantime, in February of 1896 in Miami, Isidore Cohen, the first documented Jewish settler in modern Miami, had set up shop as a clothier on the south bank of the river, but there wasn't any bridge there. So, you know, you've got that particular challenge at that point. Eventually, within about two months, he would move his business to the north bank, where the action was much to the chagrin of the Brickle family. Um, in March of 1896, John Sewell, who was one of the big foremen for the flag organization in terms of their construction projects, moved 12 African Americans with him from West Palm Beach to the Miami River to begin to lay out, uh, clear the land, lay the foundation, build the Royal Palm Hotel. And one of the first things they did was they developed an Indian burial mound, which also contained the remains of some soldiers who had served at Fort Dallas in the 1830s, 40s, and perhaps even the 1850s. Um, Sewell estimated it was about 25 feet in height and about 75 feet in length. And in photographs, we have photographs of that, in, that, that first day of this action, uh, you can see that it is quite a burial mound. Incidentally, that mound stood right on the edge of the water. The waters of Biscayne Bay at that time came in as far uh, west as about where um, that new complex uh, met square sits on the north bank of the river. In other words, it comes in the equivalent of about three to four blocks west of where the shoreline is today. That's all landfill going back to the 1920s. So you've got Sewell beginning to clear land with his workers for that great hotel. Meantime, the Hotel Miami, which was built by Julia Tuttle in conjunction with other people, is unfinished. It sits on Avenue D, today South Miami Avenue, the oldest street in Miami. Uh, but there's such a, a push for accommodations that people are even being accommodated there in an unfinished state. For example, uh, Dr. James Jackson would come down a little later on in the spring and he and his bride would take a room there. And for some people, you had to actually access a second floor by an outside ladder to get into the place. There weren't even any doors over the apartments initially. Um, by the spring of 1896, new businesses began to spring up along Avenue D, today South Miami Avenue. You had the first newspaper began printing on May 15th, 1896. The first bank, the Bank of Bay Biscayne, on April 3rd, excuse me, on May 3rd, 1896. Brady's Grocery Store around that time. The Lummis Brothers had a general store. There was a pool hall. And these are buildings, wood frame, Dade County Pine, because it was a primarily a piney wood area at that point uh, on the north bank as opposed to the thick hammock on the south bank of the river. And so you begin to see them developing along that avenue. Uh, lots of Miami were now for sale. The town was dry initially. Those deeds to all the property there, Julia Tuttle was very much a, a temperance person, didn't want any booze on her property. 
Flagler agreed to that, of course, except for one exception, you'd be able to imbibe alcoholic beverages in his Royal Palm Hotel once it opened, which was at the outset of 1897. The tracks reached, meanwhile, the railroad's progressing south. The railroad tracks reached Lemon City at about 61st Street uh, in early April of 1896, and they were in Miami four days later, April 7th. So they're really moving with hundreds of people at various times working for the railroad to extend it all the way south to the Miami River. First train entered Miami with Flagler and some of his top officials aboard, unscheduled in many ways, April 13th. The first scheduled passenger train, April 15th, 1896. And soon after that, with businesses going, the hotel itself nearing completion, uh, hundreds of people now in Miami, primarily men, many of whom had temporarily left their families to, to situate themselves with a new job before bringing their families down here with them, uh, they began to talk about incorporation. And certainly the Flagler people are very interested in incorporation. There's an informal meeting in June of 1896 to schedule an incorporation date, to decide on the proposed city's borders, uh, its name, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the big pushes came from the Flagler organization. They wanted to deal with how you're going to police the city, what's the story on water for people to drink, what are you going to do with, with sewage and its treatment. And so there was this meeting that uh, occurred in the middle of June of 1896 that then set a date for the formal incorporation of Miami as a city on July 28, 1896. And to come into... Uh, according to Florida code at the time, to come in uh, as a city, as opposed to a town or a village, you would need 300 registered voters. And we had a lot of people, and again, it was unfortunately only for males at the time. And the irony, of course, is that Julia Tuttle's a mother of Miami and could not vote at this meeting. But you had a, a lot of males who were voters. Uh, you had a lot of African-American workers who were registered by John Sewell uh, to become voters. In fact, 181 of them would be participants in the incorporation meeting. He referred to them as his black artillery. Sewell wrote a memoir in the 1930s and uh, talked about that early incorporation. So at the meeting that took place in the lobby building, a two-story wood frame building not too far from the Miami River, North Bank, uh, on the east side of Avenue D is where the incorporation took place between 2 and 10 p.m. We didn't have electricity at the time, so you had to burn something to illuminate the building as nighttime descended upon this brand new city, incorporation took place there by acclamation, the voters, and all together 368 people at different times attended the incorporation meeting. They voted by acclamation to incorporate and organize a city government under the corporate name of the city of Miami. They chose that name over Fort Dallas. And they also agreed on the boundaries that had been tentatively agreed to uh, at that meeting in mid-June of 1896, Miami's northern border would be today's uh, northwest, northeast 11th Street. It would go east as far east as a mile into Biscayne Bay, as far south as Biscayne Bay. And then the western border is very interesting. Northwest 7th Avenue, northwest 8th Avenue as we're moving south, southwest 8th Avenue. And then as we're moving east, southwest 11th Street over to, as we're moving east again, uh, and south. Uh, southwest and southeast 15th Road. Uh, those were the original corporate borders then of this young city of Miami, or I should say this brand new city of Miami. They also selected the Royal Palm Tree as an official city tree. Um, they elected a mayor, um, uh, John B. Riley, who was the son-in-law of Joseph A. McDonald, who was Flagler's most important representative uh, overseeing incorporation and overseeing the, the building of early Miami. Uh, they also selected then, elected a board of aldermen, the lawmakers from Miami. It was a large board with a lot of the most prominent people, including Joseph A. McDonald, a man named Walter Graham, who was a newspaper editor, an attorney, a physician. It goes on and on and on. Um, up, upon the incorporation of Miami and upon these various actions taken, uh, we mentioned the Royal Palm Tree as a city tree, which was good because it's native to the Everglades and areas around there, including parts of the Caribbean. Um, the county solicitor, uh, James B. Sanders of West Palm Beach, uh, was there, and he said, let's let loose with three cheers for the new city of Miami. And essentially, in unison, um, the incorporators proceeded that way. The best talk for incorporation was given by an African-American, um, Alex or A.C. Lightburn. Uh, and this is chronicled by Isidore Cohen in his memoir of early Miami. 
And then at the very end of everything, Henry Flagner sent a congratulatory telegram. I wanted to share that with you and make sure we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, Henry Flagler received from Joseph A. McDonald. Um, he had wired the results to Flagler, who was in New York at the time. He had an office in New York, as well as St. Augustine, as well as West Palm Beach. Uh, Flagler said, Telegram received. I congratulate the citizens of Miami upon the harmony which marked the election yesterday and trust that the auspicious beginning will result in future prosperity, which will equal the most sanguine expectation of the people of the new city. Henry M. Flagler. Mr. Flagler was ecstatic, but also quite formal, as you can see, in his verbiage. So we've got a brand new city of Miami that went from nine people in 1895 along the mouth of the river to an estimated within the corporate limits now of hundreds of people, perhaps 700 people at that time. So let's see if we can um, take some questions here. I see so many nice notes from different people. Um, uh, and I'm all set to handle any questions you might have. You might feel free to kind of write them in. Um, okay, let's see. Please review how you get to the show on Facebook. I'm going to put you in contact, uh, Camille, with uh, Vanessa Contreras from History of Miami. She's the, uh, the tech guru. You can reach her at 305-202-4094. Uh, and uh, she'll certainly help you get into this program. And I want to say hello to Susan Gladstone at the Jewish Museum of Florida. Melissa Myers watching. Hi, Melissa. Um, Vanessa, of course, is watching. Uh, Lainey Wright is watching. Hi, Lainey. How you doing? Uh, Pamela is watching. Julio is watching. Kiki. Uh, Corey. Uh, Claudia, thank you. Valsies Vendor. Allison Smith. Where did the name Miami come from? That's a great question. There's so much speculation behind that. There, there was a group of Native Americans living along the west side of Lake Okeechobee at the time of the Spanish entry, which was in the 1500s. And in fact, Lake Okeechobee at one point was known as Lake Miami, spelled differently, M-A-I-Y-A-M-I, while the Miami River had many different names. But by the 1800s, Lake Okeechobee is Lake Okeechobee, and the, and the Miami River is the Miami River. So that's probably one way in which Miami became the name. Where did Fort Dallas come from? Jacqueline's question, why was it passed up from Miami? Fort Dallas uh, came from the fact that there was a fort named for a naval officer in the area in the 1820s. There was a fort during the Indian Wars, the first, excuse me, the second and third Seminole Wars that were fought from the 1830s to the late 1850s. And they had called it Fort Dallas. It had been on Key Biscayne and then moved to the Miami River back and forth a couple times and it became stationary in the Miami River. That is the built environment, at least part of that, as well as William English's slave plantation house that Julia Tuttle saw when she first came here in the 1870s and fell in love with the area. And that's the area that she would purchase. Uh, Miami was chosen over Fort Dallas, um, I think because it's probably a much more pleasant name and certainly less militaristic. Fort Lauderdale had a great opportunity to call Fort Lauderdale Los Olas instead of Fort Lauderdale, but they stuck with Fort Lauderdale. Um, we've got somebody here, Brian, from um, the First Presbyterian Church, and he wants to say something, and I want to say something, too, because he's going to say what I'm going to say. The first religious establishment that opened in 1896 on Avenue D was the First Presbyterian Church in a tent. Then it graduated to a pavilion, both on Avenue D, and then in 1900, with Mr. Flagler's generosity, they built a magnificent church on Southeast 3rd Avenue on the south side of Flagler Street. And it was there until the late uh, 1940s when it moved to its present location. Uh, here's a question from Melissa. Dr. G, does History of Miami have the original incorporation documents? I hope we have, and we should have a copy of it. It's a very long story. I discovered these back in the early 80s when I came back to Miami after graduate school in the office of a, uh, an attorney friend of mine. And we were able to exhibit those as part of a centennial exhibit at History of Miami on the city's 100th birthday in 1996. We certainly have copies of it. Uh, my birds' names, according to Laney, there's Picky Picky and Flip Flop. Excuse me, Flip Flop passed away. It's Picky Picky and Kiwi. Uh, my daughter has a, a very good imagination. Um, 
Jorge, can't wait to see you on the River Tour, and there will be good times again, and we'll be able to do these wonderful things. Julia Tuttle is buried, Allegra, in Miami, in the Miami City Cemetery, the 13th or 14th burial. And there's a circle uh, that's dedicated to her. Once you enter it from Northeast 2nd Avenue, the circles may be not even 100 yards uh, west of where you are. So I would really like to thank everybody for joining me today. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the Brickle family. I think you might find that very interesting. I've recently finished, I co-authored with Casey Paquette, a book on the Brickle Avenue neighborhood. And that'll be coming out. It's supposed to come out in the summer. We're not sure what the delay will be now. Uh, so I'm anxious to talk about the Brickles also um, and kind of put a light on their presence, essentially on the south bank of the river. But uh, I want to thank you all so much for joining me today and look forward to that. And then Friday, one of my favorite topics, the great real estate boom of the mid-20s which takes Miami from essentially a frontier town to um, an emerging metropolitan area. And it's something I've written a lot about and I'm really, really interested in. So thank you all so much. It's been such a uh, pleasure for me to do this. And I want to thank History Miami Museum for giving me the opportunity to do this too. So we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow. Thanks so much for visiting. Bye-bye now.